Coming up next on Passion Struck. We gathered stories of awe from 26 countries, took two years with speakers of 20 languages to translate them. And then we classified them. Like what brings people awe? I was expecting nature, maybe spirituality. It turns out it's other people, the moral beauty of other people. And it is things like their kindness, sharing food with a stranger, their courage, it's humility. It's the ability to overcome things, to persevere. You see somebody who's born with a physical condition and lo and behold, they walk around the country and you're just like, man, look at the strength and character and morality and goodness of humans. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become passion struck. I am so ecstatic today to welcome Dacker Keltner to Passion Struck. Welcome, Dacker. It's good to be with you, John. Well, Dacker, I first learned about you and your work from our mutual friend, Susan Kane, and I was wondering, how did you and Susan first meet? Yeah, I almost tear up when I think about my friendship with Susan and our conversations. She and I first met when we talked about her book, Quiet, and this background research, where she advances the thesis that the quieter, more introverted types of people have a new place in leadership and advancing culture today. And so I've done a lot of work on leadership or power. And, and so she and I started to talk about that question of how is it that the quiet people in classrooms and hospitals and design firms and tech and the like are, are moving into positions of leadership. And I was astonished, John, just like you, at her insights. She just has a way of thinking about big phenomena, like how is the world changing? Who's doing that work? Quieter people today. What is the nature of emotion and bittersweet? And then starting with that conversation or a couple of conversations, I just was astonished at her depth. And she and I check in every six months to a year and just talk. And in a way, we were joking about this. It's like an old style friendship where it's really grounded, not in quick texts or Instagram posts or like, but just like long conversation, you know, about where we are and what we're doing. So when I go to New York, I see her and then follow her thinking and I'm influenced by her thinking deeply. So I, it's a cherished friendship. Well, quiet had a huge impact on me personally because I was in these corporate roles and was wondering what was wrong with me because my yeah. peers would have all this energy, yeah, would always be so vocal and in their expressions and I was the exact opposite, and I kept trying to make myself to be more like them. And yeah. her book really showed me the power of being an introvert and why we are so different. Yeah. And it, it's interesting. It, it makes contact with some of the stuff I've been thinking about, how we need people who are more humble and other-oriented, who serve others, who bring out the good in others as part of the corporate world. So her book was profound. It was a big book. So, And kudos to her. Well, speaking of books, her latest one, Bittersweet, is all about painful emotions, something that you're an expert in. You wrote a best-selling book yourself called Born to be Good. Yeah. And I want to ask, how are emotions like compassion, gratitude, and love the glue of our social relationships? Yeah, that question. That's my entire career, John. <laughs> uh. So it's taken me a while to, to get to that. When you look at our most meaningful social interactions, right? With your children or with your best friends or a romantic partner or flirting with somebody or going to work and feeling really envious or exhilarated, you start to get the sense that feelings or emotions, these brief states that we call emotions, have really important things to say about our social lives, who we fall in love with, 
who we trust at work, how we parent a child, how we get along with our neighbors. And that sort of observation led a variety of different scientists, including myself, about 30 years ago to make the case that really wasn't well established in a lot of the annals of scholarship, that emotions are like a language of our social life. We express them in facial expressions and voices. We use words. They motivate actions. And when you think carefully about your most meaningful moments in your social life, emotion is usually right there, right? You're falling in love with somebody and forging a bond. You want to ask for forgiveness from somebody whose feelings you've hurt. You're at work and you feel ashamed about a mistake you've done. And so starting with that insight that emotions are this language of our most important relationships, there are now thousands of studies around the world that speak to that general idea. Yeah, I find the work that you started pretty much the same time I was entering college. So it was 1988. <laughs> it, was, exactly. it, was, it, it was interesting because you were looking at the cognitive neuroscience revolution that was going on at the time. Yeah. And through that lens, you discovered this missing link, which was the emotional revolution, which, wow, it's come such a long way in the past 30 years. It has. And just to give you a couple of examples, I'll give you two that are really game changing. One from our lab. If you look at Danny Kahneman's thinking about, and Amos Tversky, about how we make choices and have preferences for this political candidate or that political candidate or buy this home or that home or this economic investment or that other, there was no role for emotion in those decisions. That's absurd, right? Now we know that economic decisions, political decisions, consumer decisions are emotional. They involve our gut. And our lab came with people like Jen Lerner and said, wow, fear is really important to the choices we make. Sadness too, anger is important to decision-making. Another example is John Haidt's work on morality. Prior to his thinking, the field just ignored how we make moral decisions about how long of a sentence should that criminal get? How should I punish this person who's taken my money? What are the moral things I care about in life? It had no statements about emotion. And John came in and said, there are these moral emotions like disgust and compassion and anger that are fundamental to our moral lives. So yeah, it's. I'm glad you see it as having come a long way. I agree. I think we're now living in this age of emotion for better and worse. <laughs> and <laughs> hopefully we can learn from it. Well, you had such a unique upbringing. And oh at God. one time, your neighbors were the Doors and Joni Mitchell. Yeah. Your mom taught poetry. Your father was a painter. Yeah. But I didn't grow up that long after you. But I would certainly tell you that our dinner table wasn't filled with stories of the Vietnam War or yeah. talking about civil rights. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you, how did your unique upbringing influence your path and eventually where you are now? Yeah, thanks for asking that, John. Sometimes when you write books, like Awe in particular, this book that just is out that I wrote, you engage in this deep reflection on like, why am I, why do I care so much about emotion and decision making, emotions like awe and beauty and compassion? And it took me back to my childhood. And I did have a pretty unconventional childhood, even though my dad was a fireman as well as an artist, but I was born in Mexico. I grew up as you say, in Laurel Canyon in the late 60s, where Joni Mitchell was around and the doors and the mamas and papas and the birds. And it was the late 60s. And it was a wild time of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy and Malcolm X and the war protests that my parents took part in. It taught me a few things. One is, like we've been saying, my mom and dad both were influenced by poets, writers, painters, the Romantic Movement, and Francisco Goya, who cared a lot about passion, who said art is about passion and getting us to wake up. And then, yeah, it was just part of a time. I remember vividly when Martin Luther King was assassinated, and just like my parents talked to me about it, and I was seven, and the funeral procession, and just the sense of sadness about that. And, and so it, it was just a time that shaped people, young people like me to, in this case, think about what would I study emotion? What emotion should I care about? Things like compassion that Martin Luther King was so strong. It was a profound influence on my life. 
Yeah, well, there are a number of books that have come out over the past year. And yeah. in fact, one is coming out this week from Susan McSalmon, who's a professor at Johns Hopkins, but it's all on the power of the arts and creativity yep. and how that can foster all like we're going to talk about, but also yeah. leads to helping people with things such as loneliness yeah. or overcoming trauma, oppression, things like that. So it is really a profound link. Yeah, it is. And you've really sketched out, John, the lab science began in the late 80s, like you said, and we started to discover things about the face and the emotional brain, Joe Ledoux, and how it shapes decision making, our lab, morality, John Hyde. And now we're having these different conversations 40, 35 years later of, wow, maybe the emotions that art can create or music can create will help people with dementia. Maybe you will live longer if you surround yourself with the emotion of awe and finding it in nature, which turns out to be true. And then Vivek Murthy, our Surgeon General, thanks to this literature is saying, loneliness is one of the central health challenges worldwide. We've broken down community, we've moved away from friends and family. Too many people like you cited are lonely and that's an emotional problem. And here's the chief doctor of the United States saying, this has to change healthcare. We have to think about emotions. Well, I've talked a lot about loneliness on this show because it's something that's so chronic. And when you think about it, yeah. one out of every three people globally, they just completed a 20 year study that showed 33% of people in 120 countries experience it. The one that was shocking to me was Brazil is the highest and yeah. There, it's 57% of the population, which oh was God. just mind blowing. Yeah. And this goes back to emotion, which is you think about all the emotional joys of being in a strong community, of sharing laughter and touch and gratitude. And you, yeah, there's a lot of conflict, but then you forgive and you share food together. And now globalization has brought a lot of freedom to individuals, a lot of progress, which is great, but it also has broken down the emotional communities that used to sustain us. And that's a challenge for today. I'm glad you're profiling it on your show, John. Well, just think about when you and I were both kids. I remember getting home from school and from the time I did my homework till we ate, it was just go out and enjoy nature with your friends. And we had exactly. so much fun exploring. And I look around my neighborhood that has a lot of kids and not a single one is ever outside playing. And it really scares me. There stu recent studies are showing that adults use of phones is five to five and a half hours a day. And that for adolescents, it's even higher. Wow. And what scares me is we're creating this society where people are living in the metaverse instead of the real universe. And I think with just panic, what yeah. this is gonna do to my kids are 19 and 24. Yeah, them and these growing generations who are living in the cyber world more than they are in reality. And it's breaking all their relationship bonds. We've engaged in this massive experiment without consent and without forethought. What will this do? And I think, John, you've hit the central problem that I think our digital revolution is going to bring. And I don't think it's changing our consuming habits or political attitudes, et cetera. I think it's going to disrupt our basic relational capacities that it's going to hurt empathy. It's going to hurt our ability to laugh together, to coordinate at work. So I think we're in for some real striking developments. So glad you're profiling. Yeah. My son and I often talk about his career future because kids in their early twenties right now are really worried because they're yeah. hearing all these reports that hundreds of millions of jobs are going to disappear. So they're wondering, what should I study when there's a high likelihood that I'm going to just have to relearn a different skill set? And the common theme that I keep hearing from more and more people that have been on the podcast, I've been telling my son now is I think the most important thing that you could study is the science of human connection. Because regardless of how much everything changes, Fundamentally, AI can't replace human connection. No, and I agree. And the data 
But the emotional intelligence data of Mark Brackett, and the social intelligence data is really robust on that. In today's 21st century, given the nature of teams and work, and yeah, there'll always be the data analysts and the people who write code, and but we need people who are smart at social connections. And there's now a robust science that points the way. Well, speaking of relationships, you and I both through our lives had a very strong relationship with a younger sibling. Yeah. I have two younger siblings, but unfortunately, I share something in common with you, and that is my sister has been fighting pancreatic cancer uh -huh. for the past three plus years. Hmm. And being close to someone like that, it's been really tough to see her fight so valiantly, hmm. and yet all the hurdles that just keep coming along her path. And yeah. so I was very sorry to hear about your brother, Rolf, mm. and his fight with colon cancer. So I, w I wanted to express that sympathy because I'm Thank seeing you. it firsthand myself. Yeah. But I did want to ask you, how was watching him battle this terrible disease actually an inspiration for you to write the book, Ah? Thank you, John. And I'm really sorry about your sister, and I wish her the best. Interesting, my brother Rolf, who passed away from colon cancer, figures very prominently in the book. He's in some ways the hero. And a lot of people have been reaching out to me, like you, who have had siblings go too early. Rolf was 55, I think. What happened, John, is my brother and I were extremely close. We we're 14 months apart. He was my younger brother, but bigger and a protecting guy. And we had this unusual childhood, and it sounds a bit like yours in the sense that he and I just did everything together. We roamed the countryside, we went fishing in ponds in the country, we grew up in LA, skateboarded around the wild streets, we played Little League together, basketball, tennis together. We just were true brothers. I came to see the world with him and through his eyes and hear his voice all the time and have a sense of how he would look at reality, and that was my reality. And then he got colon cancer, and colon cancer is brutal. It is, man, it's not brain cancer does some things and pancreatic others, and colon cancer is a mess because it, it just disrupts your digestion and eating and stomach and colon. And so it was two years of brutality. I teach happiness, and I teach how to handle stress, and it kept me sane. And then the night that he passed, I was there with my family, and I had no way to approach this because I wasn't brought up religious or with any sense of what happens in the afterlife, et cetera. I was a materialist or a reductionist from a biological perspective, but I started to read up on contemplative approaches to watching people die, like Joe, Roshi Joan Halifax out of the Buddhist tradition. So I was open to it. And then when I started to see my brother transition, and a lot of ministers I talk to and doctors talk about this. And then so does the near-death experience literature that I review in the book. It's like, he got really calm and quiet and peaceful. I would say he was interested in where he was going. He was unconscious, but you could he was breathing, was responding to us. His face was responding to us. And I had an experience of awe where... It just felt spiritual. It felt like he was going to a place. I felt him being pulled there. I saw space vibrating almost. When you lose a brother or sister who you're close to or a child, it knocks you out of your universe. And I was a mess. I wasn't sleeping well. I could work, but I was just really disoriented. And I literally heard a voice, John, say, go find awe. Your brother was where you found awe, man, backpacking and fishing and going to sporting events and music. And he was gone. I literally grabbed a bunch of books that I cared about. And I went off by myself and just started writing. And that led to this book, To Find Awe. Well, thank you for that story. I, uh, my grandmother died of colon cancer. So yeah. I've been through part of that experience. And my other grandmother was actually the last person who talked to her and moments after our conversation, she passed away. But mm. similar to that, there was just something different about that conversation where yeah. I could just sense she was moving from one world to the other. 
and had a piece about her that it's hard to describe. Yep. And it's been humbling, John, when the conversations around this book, I've been in touch with a lot of people who work with grief and bereavement and approaching and hospice care. And they feel like there's a lot of awe and transformation in the process, right? Our research finds that too, that the life and death cycle is just, it's incredible. It's transcendent. It's mysterious. And I hope that this book and for our audience now, it engages them in thinking about how do we think about this great mystery of life that it ends. And it helped me enormously to grow out of the grief in searching for new forms of awe. Yeah, I don't know about you, but for me, I just remember seeing my son so vividly when he was born and just how it basically took my breath away. Just, Ah. it's hard to even explain. Yeah, life is incredible. Well, speaking of great books, last year, one was produced by Bob Waldinger, who you probably are familiar with. He's the director of the Harvard Study of Adult Aging. And it was actually on the topic of how do you create a good life, which is what your book is all about as well. Yeah. Their study has found that it's really relationships and human connections that create joy and meaning. However, your work has led you to a slightly different conclusion. And what is that? Yeah, I appreciate how thoughtfully you're situating this work on awe in this broader literature on well-being. There's this new interest in psychological science in the study of happiness called meaning. Really nice work by Crystal Park. Meaning is is core passion. It is your sense of purpose, your sense of what is my life really about in the deepest sense, almost a, a spiritual sense. It turns out that awe is that, right? How Where you find awe, how you find it, what it feels like, the insights that it brings you lead you on a path that's meaningful that really is different from being happy in your relationships although it's related it's different from feeling good about life it's different from the classic sort of dimensions or pieces of well-being so this book what it does is it says there's this amazing emotion awe which is when we feel astonished by things that are vast and mysterious we find awe in these different realms, what I call the eight wonders of life, moral beauty of people, collective movement, nature, spirituality, music, visual stuff, life and death and big ideas. And if you can find five or 10 minutes of awe each day, just exploring these domains of awe, you'll feel like life is meaningful. You feel like, even for me, when I lost my brother, I was in a lot of pain, but I found enormous meaning in it when I was searching for awe. It is different from Every well-being researcher has their own thesis on the secret of life (laughs) and it's relationships or meditation or it's joy or it's gratitude or what have you. But awe is also an important part of that puzzle. It's a unique pathway to well-being. Yeah, well, you just hit the head on the nail of what this whole podcast is really about. I'm trying to educate people on meaning is the biggest one, but outside of that, the other two main areas are hope and connection. What great emphases. Well, I think it might be good for the audience. I'm sure that they have heard of awe before. Yeah. Maybe they don't truly understand what it really means. And you do a great job describing it in the book. So I was hoping you could bring that to life for the audience. Yeah. Well, if they don't understand, they're not alone because we didn't understand when we began this research 20 years ago. Yeah. So awe is an emotion, it's a brief state that has an expression and a physiology and a kind of what philosophers call the intentional object or what the emotion is about. And it tends to arise when we encounter things that are vast, like big things, vast in terms of the meaning for us, and that are mysterious, right? We don't immediately understand them. We're like, wow, what was that lightning storm? Or why is that big group of people moving through the streets really fast? There is mystery and vastness to awe. And then critically, To really understand your feelings of awe, we've done a lot of different research on what does it feel like? What runs through your mind? And it's fascinating. I have people come to me, John, and they'll say, I was watching my kids graduate from eighth grade and I was, they were playing a musical score and I was tearing up and 
I just felt amazed. Is that awe? And you can almost provide an awe checklist that science shows, which is, did you feel small and humble? Yeah, well, that's all. Did you tear up? Well, yeah, we often tear up when we feel awe. Did you get goosebumps, like those tingly sensations up your back? That's part of awe. Did you feel really open and curious about things? That's also part of awe. Did you want to do what William James called the saintly tendencies of mysticism, or you want to be good to people around you? That's also part of awe. So awe is this feeling that we arises when we encounter vast mysteries that makes us feel small, makes us feel connected to others, makes us in a sense want to serve. It has this kind of tearing and goosebumps. And then importantly, just to kind of round out our orientation, those eight wonders, we surveyed 26 countries around the world and we coded all their stories of awe. And these are countries from Mexico to India to China to, to South Africa to New Zealand to Poland. And we find awe in encountering the moral beauty of people, their kindness, out in nature, collective movement. I love sporting events because you start cheering, you sing the fight song, you all do the touchdown gesture. And next thing you're like, this is amazing. And then spiritual stuff, music, art. And then the final two sources of awe are big ideas, right? Man, free markets or the idea that I have choice or free will, big idea. And then finally, the life and death cycle. So awe is this feeling state that washes over us, that comes out of these encounters with the eight wonders of life. Well, as I talked to you before we got up the show, this yeah. whole area is something that interests me and it's why I've wanted to have you on the podcast for so long. And I try to interview anyone who's around this space to get different viewpoints on it. So I've had several people you probably know, David Vago, David uh -huh. Yaden, Scott Barry uh -huh. Hoffman on it. And I have really gone deep into the study of transcendence and what brings about yeah. self-realization. And yeah. it's interesting because as you're saying, it's everything from spiritual experiences to now Yaden is studying everything about how psychedelics are influencing the states of transcendence, yeah. mindfulness, which is what Bago studies. Yeah. But I wanted to get into this whole aspect of moral beauty. I think it's a different lens than anyone else is looking at this through. And it's something you deep dive in chapter four. Can you go a little bit deeper on this concept because I found it really just beautiful. Yeah, thank you, John. I really appreciate your careful reading, seriously. Your surprise is my surprise. We gathered stories from 26 countries, took two years with speakers of 20 languages to translate them. And then we classified them, like what brings people awe? And I was expecting nature, maybe spirituality. And it turns out it's other people, the moral beauty of other people. And it is things like their kindness, sharing food with a stranger, their courage. I love this story of a son from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, whose dad threw a racist out of the bar. It is wisdom. It's humility. It's the ability to overcome things, to persevere, right? You see somebody who's born with a physical condition, and lo and behold, they walk around the country. And you're just like, man look at the strength and character and morality and goodness of humans. And what's amazing is our encounters with these characteristics of people near us. It overwhelms us. We tear up, we cry, we get the chills, we are convinced we can be better people. It gives us a sense of purpose. And we call that phenomenon moral beauty. Immanuel Kant, great philosopher, talked about how very often we find our inspiration from other people. What's interesting, John, when you think about it, is that we've often thought about how we become good people in terms of, oh, I got to study great texts and religions, or maybe I have to develop a certain cognitive complexity. That was Lawrence Kohlberg's view. Or maybe I have to have these kind of moral foundation perceptions that John Hyde talked about. Here's a new view of our goodness, which is, just be open to being moved by the goodness of people around you, right? And, you know, one of the, my favorite things to do to find awe is to walk out in the streets of Berkeley or wherever I am and just look for little moments of moral beauty. I remember one 
a skateboarder helped this old woman. Her cat got stuck up in the tree and we were all paralyzed. What should we do? This skateboarder comes up, has tattoos all over, runs up into the tree, gets the cat, brings it down, gives it to the old woman. He takes off. And we were all crying and hugging. That's moral beauty. And I think you're right. I think it has this potential to change how we view our fellow human beings is just to start to think about their moral beauty. Yeah, it is interesting in society, we tend to project things yeah. like strength and external elements. And it's so shocking to me why we don't spend more time on things like honoring kindness, yeah, honoring gratitude, yeah, which are I the agree. things that really matter in life. <laughs> I know. And you think about what our culture does, right? In all the powerful media of video games and Instagram. There is a lot of moral beauty of honoring people's kindness and courage on digital platforms. Jonah Berger's done really cool research showing we love sharing that kind of content, right? But then you think about the forces of violent video games or pornography or certain kinds of cynical forms of art and Twitter outrage and so forth. And you're like, why aren't given all of our interest in these kind, these inspiring forms of moral beauty, why aren't they part of this story? And I think, I hope this book, Awe, really gets people to think about that, thinks about other ways of designing the things that lead us to convictions about human beings. In <laughs> chapter two, it's all about how do we transform our relationship to the world? And I don't think there's a better way to think about this, that being a Naval Academy graduate, one of the things that it makes us fortunate of having is uh, friends who are astronauts. So yeah. I have several former astronaut friends and one who was just on the space station uh, about six months ago. And one thing when I talk to them that they all have in common is they say their time up there completely changes their relationship yeah. to the world. And it's something that you cover in the book called yeah. the overview of effect. And I remember yeah. My buddy, Chris Cassidy, told me that he was up there and he was flying over New York City. And he said, I could just picture these people who are stuck in traffic. They're giving another person the bird. They're upset. <laughs> they're panicked. They're this. Uh -huh. And he said, from looking at it from where I was, they don't see how minuscule they are and yeah. how where they're putting their present mind is absolutely different from what he was experiencing. Yeah. And it's too bad we all can't have this oh, overview yeah. effect. Well, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's your, one of the interesting things, I followed your spirit here, John, which is, as I wrote this book, and this is a lesson for all of us, which is to put yourself in context where you really look at your life radically differently, right? And that will bring you awe. And for astronauts, the overview effect is, as it implies, is like you get out into space, suddenly you look down at the world and you're like, oh my God, check it out. And like, when I'm down on that street in New York, I'm all uptight and worried about being late for a meeting or whatever. But up here, it's like, there are a billion people doing that. It suddenly changes your view. But you can get something equivalent to the overview effect from many sources of awe, right? Stacy Bear, who's a veteran, who's a hero in my story, from rock climbing and mountaineering, you can get it from certain forms of literature or music. Some of the musicians that I spoke to really talked about how music lifts you up and allows you to look at the human condition and our small part in it. So astronauts are lucky. They get a big time experience of awe by just being out in space and looking at our world. But I think that's what awe does is it engages the imagination to look at our lives and place them in these larger systems, if you will, that bring peace to us. And so thanks for bringing up the overview effect. It's a fascinating thing. Well, the other thing I wanted to tie it to is we talked about this state of chronic loneliness that is impacting yeah. so many people, including, yeah. I'm sure, many of the people who are listening to this podcast. Yeah. And you have a connection between the overview effect and possibly something that could address some of this loneliness. And I was hoping you could just talk about that. Yeah, if I understand your question correctly, it has to do with shifting out of this self-focus. And I'm not sure if that's what you're after, John, but... Yep, it um, is. Yeah, just sociologists started writing about this. Wow, we're in, like in the late 70s, 
early 80s. We're in this self-focused era, this generation of individualism and self-expression and self-interest, make wealth and self-focus. There's a lot of good to it, of freedom and rights and self-expression. That's good. But we have become a self-obsessed culture. And we take selfies and we think about ourselves and we reflect on what other people think about us. And to an excessive degree, and there are now a lot of data that show that mental orientation makes us anxious, self-critical, ashamed, sometimes depressive, and lonely. And they interact. When we feel lonely, we become too self-focused. And one of the astonishing things about experiences of awe, any kind of awe, you can listen to a piece of music that brings you the tears. You can be out looking at a beautiful sky wherever you are and find awe, is it reduces self-focus. It just suddenly makes you realize, like, I'm small, <laughs> like the overview effect. In fact, I'm really small. And my concerns, I hate to say it, are insignificant. <laughs> <laughs> In the big sweep of history, whether or not I said the best thing at the dinner party or got a good grade, that doesn't matter. And awe brings that to and what I love is we did research, for example, in Yosemite, the national park. And once you're in a national park, you suddenly don't think about yourself. Once you go walking in search of all, you don't think about yourself as much. And it gives you those joys of the overview effect of, I feel free. I don't feel so stressed right now. And what a good thing for our times. Yeah, my folks have lived in Chattanooga, Tennessee for over 30 years, and they live oh. on one of the mountains around it called Walden's Ridge. And uh -huh. there's this point that you can look at called S Signal Point, and it's during the Confederate War. The soldiers were up there signaling the troop movements of the Union forces to the other Confederates who were on Lookout Mountain across the Tennessee River. But what's interesting is there's a pathway that you can go on, and I'd always wanted to, to do it, and I one day go on this long hike and about two miles into it i turn this corner and all of a sudden a 200 foot waterfall wow. emerges wow. and it's one of these moments like you were just talking about which is why i brought it up where suddenly you feel like you're in this other planet because it's yeah. <laughs> so majestic yeah. when you see that and i lived in wisconsin for four years in the wonderful city of madison didn't have the mountains of California where it's easy to get the overview effect. But man, I'll tell you, some of my best moments of natural awe, which I write about in the book, were watching these thunderstorms roll in over the plains into Madison. And you have these vast skies and the vast turbulent clouds and some lightning coming out, and they were thrilling. And we found this in our research. If you live in the desert of the Middle East or the frozen tundra of Sweden or the wild tropical areas of Mexico, you can find awe and sense that overview effect or the sense that I'm part of some vast natural process that is life. Yeah, I, I, well, absolutely. And another one that brings me there is music and mm. your regular listener, people know how much I love concerts. I love all different forms. I've been to Foo Fighter concerts where mm. you're just blown away. I've seen Metallica and felt the same way. I've ah. seen country artist. But one of the most memorable for me is I had always wanted to see Fish play in concert because wow. people tell me it's transformative. So a few years ago, I got to go to Denver and see them over a few days. Yeah. And it was such a unique experience. Uh, have you ever been to a Fish concert? I haven't, but I saw the Grateful Dead probably 10 times. So Well, pr probably something very similar. But what's interesting is when you typically go to a concert and you look down, People are moving, but they're moving in different directions. What was so interesting about fish <laughs> is everyone was just in this unison. <laughs> and, yes. And something you bring up is emotional contagion. Yeah. And I was using this as a way to try to get into it, but can you dive into that concept a yeah. little bit more? This is one of my favorites is what the sociologist studying religion called collective effervescence. And it's so interesting, John, the stories we got started to speak to this, which is once you start moving in unison with people, like you described very nicely at the fish concert, what happens is your physiology start to sync up, right? The science shows the boundaries between you and other people start to dissolve conceptually. You're like, hey, we're all part of this tribe. 
your minds, not only is the physiology and emotion starting to sync up, but your minds start to, we're all kind of thinking about the same thing, like the lead guitarist of Fish or the person giving the speech at the political rally or the, the great basketball player on the basketball court. And then this emotion overtakes you of what Durkheim called collective effervescence. It's like crackling electric energy that unites everybody. And it's powerful. And when I ask people, what is an awe-inspiring piece of music or a concert they've been to, which we've done in our research, they, like you, they talk about, man, I was at this show. We started dancing together. Next thing I'm hugging all these people. I'm asking them to go camping. We're, we are feeling like family. That's amazing. But also it happens obviously in religious ceremonies. You think about the rituals of religion. And then one of my favorites is sports where they're, there are sporting experiences that bring you awe that are as meaningful as any source of awe you might ever feel. The Red Sox finally winning that World Series. And when Cal beat Stanford on the play, this famous crazy return of a kickoff. There are people, you can look at that today. Cal doesn't have a good football team, UC Berkeley, very often. But that play makes people really inspired. It's get, so it tells us that we are such a collective species, we are so communal, and we can find this sense of awe, just being with other people as a counter to the loneliness of our times. I hope that chapter opens people up to think about new ways to find awe they might not have thought about. Well, I could tell you this year's March Madness has given us several examples of that, oh my including God. who would have ever thought Florida Atlantic University, I bet you about 90 percent of the audience had never even heard of it yeah would be in the final four or my yeah, alma nice. mater san diego state who would have guessed ah, congratulations and what's funny about that is suddenly you're feeling it you're like i'm feeling uplifted i feel excited and awesome about a sporting event and sports have a very deep and important place in our social lives so go out and see more sports <laughs> well another area i wanted to talk to you about was myths and one of my favorite books, all-time favorites, is by Joseph Campbell called The Power of Myth. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I try to read every year or two because I think it's just such a powerful lesson. But I wanted to ask, how do these mystical experiences bring about joy and bliss? I've got to read Joseph Campbell, Carl Gustav Jung, and, and the great writers about myths and legends and the like. In the book, I write about what's the meaning of awe across historical periods or time. And for a long time, Awe was really a religious emotion, and it was about conversions and experiences with the divine, however it would be defined in a particular religion of the Bhagavad Gita is about visions of God, and Paul on the road to Damascus has a famous conversion experience, and the Buddha and indigenous traditions have mystical experiences. Mysticism, which is very hot right now, in particular with the new interest in psychedelics, for example, is a lot like awe. It's when you feel a sense of amazement, you feel the self dissolving, you feel connected to something large, you feel a sense of deep purpose to the world, and you also feel in connection to the divine, what you think of as supernatural and primary and good and life giving about the, the universe, the spiritual force. William James said, feeling, religion is feeling. It has belief, it has practices, it has ceremonies and rituals, but at its core, it's about feeling. And once you take that as a starting point, then you ask, well, what are the really important spiritual emotions? And awe is one. A lot of people feel spiritual awe that they are in prayer or meditating or reading the Upanishads or out in nature. 40% of Americans think that their relationship to nature is divine. They think spirit is part of nature. And that's awe. And then it's just this wonder at being part of something large that feels that it transcends physics and psychology, spirituality. And then there are other emotions that just haven't been studied, John, like bliss when we totally dissolve, a sense of horror or terror sometimes, reverence. I try to offer one answer from a more social, scientific, biological perspective on what is the nature of mystical feeling? Here's one view. And then that invites the reader to think about how that works for their own experiences and how else they would think about their own spirituality. 
Dr. Dacker, one thing that was interesting to me is I went into this thinking that there was going to be a universal expression of awe. Yeah. But it seems to differ based on your culture and where you're from. Why is that? Well, we express our emotions in the voice and the face and in words and in stories and myths and in music and painting, right? To help other people understand our feelings because they're so important to our social life. And then we build a culture out of that process. And obviously each culture has its own unique language of all that it shares with others through expressions, right? In how they vocalize the emotion, the words they use. One of my favorite examples are the myth and, and godlike concepts that cultures create to express mystical experience. And in Japan, they have this whole tradition of the yokai, which are these little gods and goblins that are out there that produce a lot of the awe-inspiring things, right? So when the sun sets or there's dusk or a big storm or weird darkness or eerie sounds, they think that's really produced, as a lot of cultures have, by these little godlike figures. So cultures are always just like with the sounds we use to produce language, they're expressing emotions in strikingly different ways. But there's a lot of universality to it, too. Of all cultures have myths. All cultures like to paint awe. Or all cultures chant in a way that brings about awe as an expression of mystical feeling. So it's this great combination of what's universal and specific to who we are. And I have two questions left for you. And this one's yeah. going to be a fun philosophical question. So we uh -oh. talked about astronauts earlier. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, if you got selected to be an astronaut on the mission to Mars, and you were given the ability to put one edict or philosophy into place for this new planet that would help guide it, what would it be? I thought a lot about that question, like Einstein and Descartes and Rachel Carson and many others. I really feel that awe is almost a basic state of consciousness for the human mind. It is a fundamental property of how we relate to the world, right, is to be filled with wonder and awe. And I encountered so many great quotes about that property of our minds and existence. And then return to somebody who my dad introduced me to when I was a late teenager, Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching. It's one of my Bibles, if you will. And this quote is what I would put on Mars, which is, from wonder into wonder, existence opens. From wonder into wonder, existence opens. And to me, our lives are like this, which is they move from one mystery to another that we should be curious about. And that's existence. It almost speaks to Darwin's thinking about evolution, which is we move from one state to another as we evolve, and that's the nature of existence. It's always opening and changing and evolving. And so I think that gets as close to what I think this book is about, but also what I think human identity in our lives are about, which is moving from one mystery to another and be curious about it. And that's what existence is. Well, that was... Incredible. And you just answered the second question I was going to ask you, but <laughs> I mean, <Far> away. <laughs> but really what you just said is that awe reveals the deep systems that connect us all. And that's yeah. really what your whole book is about. <laughs> it is. We've, we're deluded into thinking that it's just me and I, and that's what the world is. Instead, the world has all these incredible systems that a system of a storm system and a ecosystem of a tide pool and food systems and the family is a system and a polit political group's a system and we're part of them and I think to combat loneliness we have to open our minds and remember and realize that we are part of all these broad systems out there that constitute society and the world and the earth and we're part of them the magic of all is no matter where we find it it opens us up to that idea that I am part of something larger. And I love Jane Goodall's quote on this, which is, she felt chimps had very beginning forms of awe. And she said, isn't it amazing? And that's really the key to awe and, and our early forms of spirituality even, is to be amazed at things outside of yourself. 
And I think our times need that sentiment. Well, we are definitely adrift, not only here in the United States, but yeah. as we see on the news on a daily basis throughout so much of culture today. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I wanted to ask is if a listener has tuned into this extremely fascinating talk we've had today, what's one thing that they could take away from it that they could apply right now in helping them get closer to the good life? Yeah, John, I have a lot of ideas about that in the book, but also importantly is the Greater Good Science Center, greatergood.berkeley.edu is a center that disseminates the knowledge of happiness and the practices of happiness to over a million people a month, and it's all free. And we've taken 21 years at UC Berkeley to build it with generous gifts from people like Tom Hornaday and Ruthann Hornaday who helped us found it. And it's just there to, just like this conversation and what you're doing with this podcast is we need conversations and ideas and practices around the good life so we can find it again, because we are adrift and we need to do good work on that. So I'd look at that as well as the book. Well, Dacker, thank you so much. It was such an honor to have you on today and to the audience, please read this amazing book and all of Dacker's books are truly amazing. Thank you so much again. John, thank you for all your really thoughtful questions and the directions you've taken this new study of awe that's been part of it, our work. I thoroughly enjoyed that interview with Dacker Keltner, and I wanted to thank Dacker and Penguin Random House for the privilege and honor of having him here on today's show. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Strike podcast I did with C. McDermott, a precision wellness practitioner who holds a doctorate of philosophy in integrative nutrition. C. focuses on preventing disease and optimizing lifestyle through nutrition, behavioral change, mindset, as well as stress management. C is the author of the international best-selling book, Your DNA, Your Life. Let's start a health revolution. Let's start a wellness revolution because in my mind, average is a standard that includes chronic disease, which I don't think anybody wants that to be average. I don't think anybody's happy with that average. And I think anybody with a chronic disease, which is up to 65% of the population and a quarter of children, if you're in that situation, you certainly can't say that, that that's a, a perfect place to be currently. The fee for this show is that you share it with family or friends when you find something interesting or useful. If you know someone who's interesting in learning everything about awe, then definitely share today's episode with them. The greatest compliment that you can give us is to share the show with those that you love and care about. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can live what you listen. Till next time, live life passion struck. <laughs>